evening scripture reading is from Acts, second chapter, verses 36 to 42. I will be reading this from the New King James Version. Starting in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has raised this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut through the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off as as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Good evening. If you happen to be visiting with us, we want you to know that normally at this time we have Bible classes for all ages, but since this is the first Sunday of the month, we, we kind of change things up a little bit and we have a second worship service on Sunday evening, as, as just like we do on Sunday morning. And so if you're visiting, if you've visited in the past and you see something a little different, that's why it's a little bit different. We just choose to do things a little differently on the first Sunday night of the month. All of our members, of course, know that and are acquainted with that custom. Uh, but we wanted our visitors to know that as well. And we also want to know you to know that you're welcome. We're glad that you're here. And we hope you'll visit us after services and, and bring us your questions. It's very likely, especially in a lesson like tonight, it's very likely you may hear some things that you've never heard before, some things that may shock you a little bit. And we're open to your questions and comments because all we really want to do is follow the scriptures. And as I look at that picture, boy, doesn't that look good. Mm -mm. I tell you what, breakfast food is my favorite food. You know, a lot of people like steak and all that stuff, but, uh, you know, I just assume have that for my last meals, anything right there. Eggs and bacon and hash browns and only thing missing is toast, uh, you know. <laughs> so uh, good stuff, good stuff. I like that. But as you can see, we're going to be talking about the, the title of the sermon is Where is Your Kitchen, Your Coffee Bar, Your Gym, and Your Swing Set? The text that I had read just a few moments ago by Brother Al uh, is talking about what we call the birthday of the church. This was the day that the church of Christ came into existence. And when I say birthday of the church, I want you to understand this wasn't the birthday of the Catholic church. And this wasn't the birthday of the Methodist church. You can look in your history books and find out that their birthdays were much, much, much later. This was the birthday of the church that Jesus built. The church that where he said, I will build my church in Matthew 16 and verse 18. And the interesting thing as you read through this that's missing in all of this is the emphasis that you see in so many modern churches on what we call the social gospel. You drive by a lot of church buildings today, and as you go by, if you look in the backyard, you'll see swing sets out there. Sometimes you'll see a ball diamond out there. You'll see a soccer field out there, a football field. And if you were to go inside, you may find that they've actually built a great big gymnasium onto the building. Uh, they usually call them family life centers or all-purpose rooms because uh, they, they want to make sure it sounds spiritual, you see. They don't want to make it sound like it's social or secular, so they want to make sure it sounds spiritual, so they, they rename it. It's not a gym anymore. No, no, it's a family life center because we're all about family. And, and you know, you start talking to people and they say, well, well, how often do you get together and have a meal? As though that meant something. Or they'll say, well, what do you do for the kids? And what they mean is, they don't mean what kind of Bible studies do you have. What they mean is, do you have swing sets in the back? And do you have fun activities uh, like football and baseball and things for the kids? But the interesting thing is, as you read through the Bible, you don't ever find that. Never. When you start studying about the churches of the New Testament from this very birthday forward, 
uh, in, in Acts 2, going forward in time, you never find that emphasis in the scriptures. Uh, just read those verses with me once again in verse 36. And Peter's bringing his sermon to a conclusion. And, and maybe we would, might even say extending the invitation here. It says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That was really the theme of his sermon. They'd crucified Jesus, and God had exalted him. God had raised him from the dead and made him the king of kings and the Lord of all lords. And it almost seems like they interrupted Peter in the midst of his preaching. It says, when they heard this, it sounds like Peter's not finished preaching, but when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And if I may just interject here, what they're asking is, what shall we do to be saved? We've made a mistake here. We've crucified the Son of God, and we realize what we've done. Now what are we going to do to get out of this? How do we get forgiveness of this? And Peter provided the answer. He said, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God shall call. Notice in that preaching and throughout that sermon, if you were to take your time tonight, go home tonight and read the entire second chapter of Acts. Peter's not up there preaching about social activities, and Peter isn't up there preaching about baseball and basketball and bowling. Peter's preaching about sin and salvation and redemption and the death of Jesus and, and how we need to turn to him and repent of our sins and give ourselves to him. This is, this is the substance of New Testament preaching. And it goes on to say in verse 40, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Now, we don't know what those many other words were, uh, but we got the gist of it right there because what he was saying with those many other words is you need to be saved from this perverse generation. Not you need to go have fun, but you need to be saved. And those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in eating meals together and playing in the gym and drinking coffee, and oh, but that's not there, is it? <laughs> that's not there. Conspicuously absent. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And so, in my mind, I'm thinking, what did these people know in the first century that people today don't seem to grasp? People, they don't seem to grasp this. They, they want the social activities. They want the social gospel. They want the gymnasium. They want the swing set. They want the coffee bar. In fact, uh, some of the elders, we were talking to somebody the other day, and he asked us that very question. You got any coffee? You got any coffee? And I'm thinking, you know, maybe we should talk about this a little bit. Maybe we should talk about why we don't do those things, why it is that this church is a little bit different. So in the sermon today, we're going to be considering that question right there. Open your Bibles and follow along. Why is it that the Fisher's Church of Christ doesn't have any of those things? And let's just start off with reason number one. There's no authority for this. Now, it's not been all that long ago we had a series of classes here on Bible authority. And by that, what I'm simply saying is permission. That's really what I'm, I'm saying. God is in charge, and God makes the rules, and God gives us permission to do certain things. He gives us permission to worship Him. And when He gives us permission, He doesn't just say, come and worship me. He says, here's how I want you to worship me. I want you to meet on the first day of the week. I want you to take the Lord's Supper. I want you to sing. I, I want you to pray. I, I want you to lay by a story. And God tells us exactly how to worship Him. He doesn't just kind of leave us to ramble on and do this however we see fit. He provides the information for us. And so we're always looking for permission. In the book of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, we know it, many of us can quote it by memory. Paul said, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through Him. In the name of Jesus means by the authority of Jesus. W.E. Vine says, and Vine is a Greek scholar, he says that means to recognize the authority of. So when we act, we have to have authorization. And there's really only three ways that that can be done. And again, that goes back to our study we had. You can do it by direct statements or commands. Statements of fact or commands. Do this or do that. Now, as a scripture on that, you have 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37. Paul said, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. And then... We learn and we gain permission by example. We see what early Christians did with divine approval, and we try to do the same thing they did because we know if we do that, we're on safe ground. 
In 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter and verse 1, Paul said, As I gave order to the churches of Galatia, notice he gave them orders, he gave them commandments, but then he says, you look at those commandments and you follow their example. You do what they did. He said, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. So we know that when we follow examples in the Bible, that with divine approval, that we're on safe ground. And then there's this thing called necessary implication. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12. And here he's talking about the two priesthoods, the priesthood of the tribe of Levi and the priesthood of Melchizedek. And he's making the argument that as the covenant transitioned from the Old Covenant or the Old Testament to the New Testament, that the priesthood also made a transition. And he's, he's dealing with that argument here. And notice what he says in verse 12. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. You see that phrase, of necessity? He's, he's saying that's a necessary implication. One thing logically follows the other. If the priesthood has been changed, the only way that can happen, the only way that the priesthood could be changed is if God had changed the law. And he did. He changed from the old law to the new, from the old covenant to the new covenant. So that is an example of a necessary implication. Now the old time preachers, I think this originated either with Thomas Campbell or Alexander Campbell, but the old time preachers used to kind of pick up on that phrase and they'd say, we speak where the Bible speaks. And we're silent where the Bible is silent. What that simply means is we just say what God said about it and we stop. We say no more. We speak where the Bible speaks, that is, God said this. And then we stop, we are silent where the Bible is silent. And that's very important because when you start speaking where the Bible is silent, I don't know whether you realize this or not, but you're putting words in God's mouth. You ever had people put words in your mouth before? Well, he said blah, blah, blah. And you have to defend yourself. No, I did not say blah, blah, blah. Here's what I said. And nobody likes to have words put in their mouth. But when we start spe speaking where God is silent, that's exactly what we're doing. We're putting words in His mouth. We're saying God will accept this and God will accept that. I think I mentioned a while back in one of our Bible studies, and I'm going to quote that, that preacher again. His name was Robert Turner. And he made an interesting, I thought it was just a fascinating statement about this whole speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. He said this, he said, if we omit the be silent where God is silent, then we shall bury the speak where God speaks under the rubble of human invention. Wow, let that, that is profound. That is absolutely profound. Let that sink in. In other words, if we ignore the be silent where God is silent, we end up doing just exactly what we want to do. And we don't care what God has said or not said about it. We're just doing what we want to do because that's what we want to do. And so when I say there's no authority, I'm saying that the local congregation, a congregation of God's people, organized uh, and functioning as God would have them to, to function according to the New Testament, does not have permission to engage in social activities, does not have permission to have a kitchen for social functions, does not have permission to have a coffee bar so we can sit here and relax with a cup of coffee during worship, does not have permission to put up a gym for your children to play in, does not have permission to put up a swing set. Now there's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves. If you have a kitchen at home, fine, I've got one too. If you have a coffee bar at home, fine, I got an old time coffee pot. I don't have one of those fancy Keurigs or whatever they call them, I don't have one of those, that's a little bit too too fancy for my taste. I got the old-fashioned one, but that's fine. And if you, if you like to go to the gym and work out, that's fine. And if you have a swing set in your backyard for the kids, that's fine. But that's not what a church is all about. That's what we're saying. It's a simple thing. It really is. It's a simple distinction. That's not why a church exists. And that brings me to my next point. Very closely tied to this, but I want to bring in another passage. In fact, I probably should have rephrased that second point, And I should have said, not only do we not have authority, but it is forbidden. Point number two should be, and if you're taking notes, that's what it should be. It is forbidden. And this is what we touched on this morning. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Corinthians had perverted the Lord's Supper, twisted it around in a number of different ways, and one of the things they had done was instead of worshiping God and, and taking the bread and the fruit of the vine in memory of Christ, that's what they were supposed to be doing, they had basically turned it into a common feast. Uh, just meet, eat, and run, eat and go, and weren't even eating it together. It wasn't even a good common meal in that sense because they weren't even eating together. And so we read in verse 20, he says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, the coming together in one place is a reference to the kind of thing we're doing tonight, where a congregation is assembled. 
and they are assembled to the worship God. He says, that's what you should have been doing. You should have been coming together to eat the Lord's Supper. If you doubt me on that, you can just read on down verse 23 through 26. You can see where he brings them right back to the Lord's Supper. And he explains in verse 21 why they're not eating the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper, not the Lord's Supper, but his own supper, ahead of others. And one is hungry, and another is drunk. So you have... You have the perversion of worship. You have people, some people running around hungry, some people running around overfilled. Uh, some people, it just was a mess. And he says in verse 22, what? Like, like what's, what's going on here? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God? Notice there's two questions there. And he's really, he's trying, he's pointing out a dilemma here. He says, you're in a bit of a fix here. You're in a dilemma. There's one of two things that's going on here that's causing this. Either number one, you don't have any houses to eat and drink in, or number two, you despise the church of God. Can you see that in his questions? Which, what's the problem here? Is it that you don't have houses to eat and drink in, or is it that you despise the church of God? Well, just analyze that a little bit. Did they have houses to eat and drink in? Of course they did. How do you know, preacher? Look at verse 34. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So I know these people had houses to eat and drink in. And so guess what? We've just eliminated that horn, that part of the dilemma, haven't we? He asked two questions. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God? Well, they have houses, so check that one off. So what was the problem? They despised the church. Now remember our lesson this morning, if you were here this morning, when he said they despised the church, it wasn't the building they were despising. They weren't defiling the building because they ate inside a church building. I don't even know if they had a church building. The word church is used in scripture of the congregation. They were despising the, the congregation is not formed, does not exist for these purposes. And he draws a contrast between eating and drinking, those are social functions, and worshiping God, those are spiritual activities of a local church. And he says those things are not, they should not be intermixed. That's clearly the, the, the principle he's laying out here. Now he's not also, he's not really concerned about locations. When he says, have you not houses to eat and drink in, he's not saying you can only eat in your house. If that were true, then the next time you go to Applebee's or something like that, you'd be in big trouble, wouldn't you? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? That's not what that means. But he's saying here that there's two realms. One is the domestic realm, where social activities take place in the home, and the other is the spiritual realm, the church. That's the contrast that's being set up here. And so not only do we not have authority, but it is, by these verses, absolutely forbidden. And we despise the church. Think of that. The word despise means to think less of, to think down upon. You see, God established the church with a high and holy and exalted purpose. And the purpose of the church is not playing. The purpose of the church is not socializing. The purpose of the church is worshiping God and spreading the gospel. And when we fail to meet that purpose, we're thinking down on the church. We're despising the church. We're thinking less of the church than what God thinks of it. And so that is not the work of a local church. So why doesn't the Fisher's Church of Christ have those things? Because it's not the church's work. Thirdly, God didn't equip the church for this. There's an interesting thing about God and about the scripture. Whenever God tells us to do something, he usually gives us the tools or the means or the permission or the teaching that we need to accomplish that. He provides what we need. And God equipped the church for a lot of things, but God did not equip the church for social activities. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, and in the context of the first 16 verses, I just want to mention this in passing so we understand. He's talking about unity in the church. So I want us to make sure we keep the verses in context. Verse 3 will bear that out. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. God's people are to be one. They're to be united, not to be divided. Uh, there's one body, you see. In fact, he says that in the very next verse. There's one body, one church, and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. So the church is to be united. In order to bring about that unity... God equipped the church with certain things. They're called gifts in this passage. Drop down with me to verse 11. And it says, And he himself, and that's Jesus he's speaking of there, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why did he give those? For the equipping of the saints, 
for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. See the word equip there in verse 11 or verse 12 there, verse 12? You see the word equipping? He's equipping us. He's equipping us that we might do what God wants us to do. In this passage, it's unity. But the church has more to do than just be united. We have, we have to be united so we can do other things. And so he equipped the church. But notice the equipment here. What's the equipment? Well, the equipment is listed there in verse 11. Apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. You notice there's one thing all of those have in common? They're all teaching functions. They're all teaching functions. Now, the apostles and prophets are related in that they're both inspired. But the difference between them is that the apostles not only were inspired, but were hand-picked eyewitnesses. They went out and gave first-hand testimony of the resurrection of Christ. That, that was their function. They were the witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus and went out and gave that first-hand testimony under the guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Prophets, perhaps not eyewitnesses, but could still give uh, inspired testimony. And then evangelists, that's just a bringer of the good news, quite literally. Uh, of the word evangelist means a messenger of good. Pastors, that's a reference to shepherds. That could be translated shepherd. It probably should be translated shepherd. That's a reference to the elders of a local church. And elders are to be apt to teach, the Bible says. And then, of course, teachers. I would equate that in our day to what we call Bible class teachers. When we have our Bible classes on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights and we go back there and study, we've got teachers for all of those classes. But you notice what he didn't give? There's, it, it's, it's conspicuously missing here. And he himself gave some to be cooks and baristas and coaches and clowns and babysitters and youth pastors. Where is all of that? It's not there. It's not there, is it? And you're not going to find that anywhere in your New Testament. You're not going to find, well, God gave this to the church. He, he gave the cooks and the baristas and the coaches and the clowns and the babies. God gave us that. No, he didn't. No, he, no, he didn't. And you're not going to find that in the Bible. And that is conspicuously absent on purpose. You see, the scripture, the Bible, is all sufficient. Now, just let that sink in for a second. And while you're letting it sink in, turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy 3. Because this is a passage that teaches the all-sufficiency of Scripture. When I say the Scripture is all-sufficient, when the Bible says the Scripture is all-sufficient, what we're saying is everything we need to know about how to serve God is right here in the book. And again, no cooks, no baristas, no coaches, none of that in there, you see. None of that's in there. That wasn't the equipment God gave. And when we read in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 and 17, he says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And here's the critical part right here. Why did God do that? That the man of God may be what? Complete. Say it again. Complete. One more time. Complete. What do you mean by that? I mean thoroughly equipped. There's that word again. Equipped. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scripture is sufficient. And so if I can't find it in the Bible then there may be a reason for that. God left it out for a reason. God left out the cooks for a reason. God left out the baristas for a reason. God left out the coaches for a reason. God left out the clowns for a reason. He didn't want them there. He didn't, want, he didn't equip the church for this kind of stuff. He didn't provide for that. He didn't make any, provide any teaching for that. He didn't provide any arrangement for that. In the book of Jude, and verse 3, Jude reminds us about how important it is to strive only for what the Scripture says. Remember, we've, we've established here that the Scripture is all-sufficient, that it has all the information that we need. And in Jude, verse 3, he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. That's a, that's a call to get back to the Bible. That's what it is. The faith, that's the gospel. That's the New Testament. That's, that's your Bible. And so get back to the faith. Contend for the faith. And when you open up the faith and you read the faith and you study the faith, you don't find the cooks and the baristas and all. You just don't find it. And that's significant. That's not an accident. That's not an accident that those things are left out. If God had wanted them there, he would have put them there. And that should, that, should, that should be a strong message to anybody who's interested in doing Bible things in Bible ways and calling Bible things by Bible name. If you're interested in following the God, interested in following the Bible, then you're going to do what the Bible says and stop. 
No more and no less. And God didn't equip the church for all these other things. I think that's very significant. Not only that, but on the first day of the week, and we did it this morning and we'll do it again tonight for those who weren't able to do it this morning, the treasury isn't collected for that reason. Every first day of the week we gather together according to Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2 it says, On the first day of the week, let every one of you put something aside, storing up. And I, and I put money into the collection plate, and you do too, and the collection goes around, and you put money in there, and I put money in there. And there's a reason we do that. There's a reason we do that. And I don't know about you, but it has never occurred to me that I'm putting my money in there to buy a new swing set for the back of the church. That, 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 that thought never occurs to me. I'm putting my money in there to, so we can buy a new gym and have some basketballs and footballs for all the kids to play with. That, that, that never, that's the farthest thing from my mind. Because when you're trained in the scriptures, you know better than that. You know better than that. And, and you think about the, the fact that the, the, the treasury is a necessary thing, by the way, because we couldn't do anything without money. We wouldn't have a place to meet without money. You wouldn't have pews to sit on without money. You wouldn't have projections to look at without money. You wouldn't have songs to sing without songbooks, which requires money. And so local churches require money. It's just a practical thing, isn't it? You can't, you can't get very much done unless you have financial resources. But the financial resources are collected for very, very specific purposes. Take your Bibles now and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy 5. When you go home this evening, read verses 3 through 16. Not going to read all those tonight. Just going to cut to the chase and read verse 16. But I encourage you to read the whole thing. And he's talking there about the care of widows. And there are certain widows who were the care of individuals and families. And there were other widows who became the care of the church. And they were, incidentally, widows who didn't have any family to turn to. You can see, for example, in verse 5, She who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God, that means she's a Christian, by the way, trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. And so she's left alone. Notice that. She's got no family to turn to. That's why she falls to the church, because she's got no family to turn to. Now it brings us to verse 16. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. Family takes care of family. Don't put that off on the church. Let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened. That it, what's the it there? The it refers to the church. That it may relieve those who are really widows. I don't know if it's dawned on you or not, but 1 Timothy 5.16 is a church treasury passage. We don't usually think of it that way. In fact, I heard one preacher one time, he said, the treasury is hardly ever even mentioned in the Bible. Well, that's not true. The treasury is mentioned in a number of places in the Bible in, by implication, if nothing else. Sometimes directly and sometimes by implication. But the church, he talks about the church relieving widows. Now, a church can't relieve widows if it doesn't have something to relieve them with. You see that? So it's a treasury passage. And not only is it a treasury passage, but it's a passage that tells you the purpose of the treasury. And it tells me here that the treasury is not just for anything I want to spend it on. That's not why I put money into the plate. So I can come in here and say, well, I want to spend it on this, and I want to spend it on that. That's No, when I turn it over to God, now it, it falls under His authority. You see that? I turn it over for His purposes. I turn it over for His work. I turn it over for His use. And now I don't have any say over it anymore. It belongs to God. It belongs to His work. And so the treasury is not collected to, to have a coffee bar or a gymnasium. or swim. That's not why we lay money aside on the first day of the week. Why do we lay money aside? Let's look at a few passages here. Acts 4. Talking about now why the treasury is collected. Acts 4, verses 34 and 35. Now the multitude, no, excuse me, verse 34. I got, I got the wrong verse. Verse 34. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked among the brethren. Why is that? For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. Proceed, that's money. And what did they do with that money? They laid it at the apostles' feet. That means they were the treasurers, you might say. They took care of the money. And they, who's that? The apostles. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. They collected a treasury. Why? For the relief of needy saints. That's one reason we put money in the plate on the first day of the week. That's one reason we do that. In Acts the 11th chapter, same thing once again. Verses 27 to 30, 
It says, in those days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Now, if you're reading the earlier parts of the chapter, you'll see there was a congregation that had been established at Antioch very recently. And the prophets came down to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. And this they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. The church at Antioch sent relief to the brethren in Judea. And so we see that they collected money for benevolent purposes. A couple more passages here. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 8, Paul's talking about his preaching of the gospel and how he was supported. The Corinthians, he didn't take any support from the Corinthians and they kind of criticized him for it and he's kind of explaining himself here. In 2 Corinthians 8, uh, 11 and verse 7, just 7 for a little context, did I commit sin by abasing myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? See, they're critical of him because he's not taking any support from them. He says, here's what I did. I, did, I didn't charge you. I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. Now, a church has to have money if it's going to pay wages, right? If a church is going to pay wages, they've got to have money. And so there's your trade. And that tells us also why we collect the money, doesn't it? We collect the money to pay wages to those who preach the gospel. We, pay, we collect the money to help needy saints. We collect the money to support the teaching of the gospel. One more verse, Philippians 4 and verse 15. This is kind of a thank you to the Philippian church who supported Paul uh, when he left uh, Macedonia. He says in verse 15, Now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Now, the only way the church could share with him is if the church had money. So it's another treasury passage. So it, it, you, you notice people who say the treasury isn't even mentioned in the Bible. I've just showed you about five passages, and I just touched the hem of the garment. I just showed you about five passages, Acts 4, Acts 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, and right here, Philippians 4, 15. Lots of passages that deal with the treasury. But nowhere do we see that they collected a treasury to build a gymnasium. Nowhere do we see that they collected a treasury to put up a swing set in the backyard or to have a coffee bar or a kitchen for social activity purposes. That's what's missing, you see. And I'm suggesting to you, by the way, if we're going to follow Scripture, if we take that money that's been laid aside for the purposes of the local church and we use it for these other things, legally what that's called is misappropriation of funds. That's what, from a legal perspective, that's what you, we can't do that. And I'm talking now, when I say legally, I'm talking about God's law. We don't have the permission from God to take those funds laid in that treasury on the first day of the week and spend it on those things up there in the title of my lesson. I'd be happy to look at your passage if you've got one, but I'm persuaded you're not going to find it, and you're not going to be able to show me one. One more point we want to make here, and I think this is very important. The attraction for people is the cross not the kitchen. It is the gospel, not the swing set. And we've missed that. Not necessarily we, but a lot of religious people have missed that. They think, well, you've got to do all these things to attract people. You've got to do all that to get them to come. You've got to do all that to get them in the door. Well, you know, Jesus taught us an important lesson about that in John 6. He was feeding the multitudes, and he stopped feeding them. And what does the text say? It says, many went back and walked with him no more. And Jesus even said in John 6, 27, You came not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Did you, did you catch that? He said, I know what you're up to. You're, you're only coming for the hamburgers and the hot dogs, so to speak. You're only coming for the loaves and the fishes. You're only, and I'm telling you, if you put up the gym and the swing set and the coffee bar, that's why people are here. They're not here to hear the gospel. They care less about that. You take away the gym and the swing set and the coffee bar, and they're gone. And that tells you all you need to know about why they're here. And it tells you that the attraction here isn't going to be those things. You're going to attract people with the cross and with the gospel. A couple of passages here. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. And this is, a, this is a very important passage. He says here, For the message of the gymnasium. No. The message of the coffee bar. No. The message of the cross. Now he's not done. 
The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Notice one message, two reactions. Did you notice that? That's by design. God designed it that way, on purpose. The same message that attracts some will repel others. I guarantee you, I can stand here and preach this lesson, and there'll be a lot of people who are members here, and they say, yes, 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 that's right, preacher. And then there'll be a lot of other people who've never heard this before, and they'll hit the door and never come back. That's the most narrow-minded bunch of people i ever heard in my life, they'll say. I don't want to be a part of a group like that. And you know, that's by design. God designed it that way. That message is supposed to sift people. It's supposed to separate people. It's supposed to draw those who want spirituality and salvation and repel those who do not. That's the way it was designed. I didn't design it that way. God designed it that way. And so I don't lose a whole lot of sleep when somebody gets angry with my preaching because I know that God designed it that way on purpose. In the book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse 16, and we know this, We've heard this quoted so many times, we can quote it in our sleep. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. In 1 Corinthians, it was the message of the cross. In Romans, it's the gospel. Same thing, because the gospel is the message of the cross. It's the same thing, but that's the power. That's the attraction. That's the pull. And I guarantee you, if you preach that pure, unadulterated gospel, the right people will find their way to you. And the right people will stay there because that's what God is trying to do. He's trying to sift the world and separate people. God is interested in a certain kind of person, a truly humble, obedient believer. That's what God's interested in. And he's designed the church and he's designed the gospel and he's designed the, the message of the cross in such a way that it brings those people out. That, you, 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 we talk about the word church meaning called out. We've been called out of all of this stuff. We've been called out of sin, and we've been called out. We see something more important. We see things that are higher, and we see things that are nobler. We see things that are more important. We see things that are more uh, eternal in their weight, and it pulls us. And it, remember what Jesus said? He said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people unto me. That's the draw, the cross, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus, the gospel of Christ. When we ignore that and we try to change the church to our liking, we rebel against God. That's it. There's no other way to say it. We rebel against God. We cannot change the church to our liking. We must follow what God has told us. The bottom line, look at the question. Where's your kitchen, your coffee bar, your gym, and, and swing set? Shorter answer is, ain't got one. Ain't got one. That's the short answer. And the reason is, there's right up there, there's no authority for it. It's not our work. The church wasn't equipped for that. The treasury isn't collected for that. The gospel is the real drawing power. Now, next week, I'll just throw this in for good measure. Next week, we're going to start a gospel meeting. And you're going to come here, and for four nights, four days, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you're going to hear the message of the cross. You're going to hear the gospel. On Sunday afternoon, we're going to leave and go someplace else to have a meal together. I'm bringing that in on purpose because I'm trying to make the point. We're not opposed to eating together. We're not opposed to playing together. We're just opposed to doing it as a church. You, you understand what I'm saying? That's the reason we, we want to make sure that we send a message, that we understand these things are separate that we understand these things don't intermix, that we understand that, that there's a reason that we do the things that we do. So I hope you'll come to our meeting. And I hope that if you have questions about the lesson tonight or about anything that happens during the gospel meeting that you'll ask them. Take out your songbooks now and turn to the song of invitation. If you're here tonight and are not a Christian, Jesus died for you. Make that personal. He died for everybody, but make it personal. He died for you so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be set free from your sins, so that you could go to heaven. He's interested in every single person, but we have to do things his way.
And so if you want those sins forgiven, if you want to go to heaven, you have to humble yourself before God. Believe that Jesus is his son. Believe that he died for your sins. Believe that he rose from the dead, that he sits at the right hand of God as King of kings and Lord of lords. Believing that, repent of your sins, turn away from them, confess your faith, and be baptized. Right behind me is a baptistry filled with water, ready to go. The only thing missing is you. Now, if you've already done that, but somewhere along the way you've messed up, it happens. If you need our prayers and you need to be restored to the Lord, we are here for you. We can pray with you and pray for you. So come right now while we stand and while we sing.